morning. I am Attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. Uh, along with my team, I'm so excited to announce uh, this lawsuit to finally get justice for Greenwood that we've been waiting on for over 99 years. This is a truly historic and emotional day for me and my team as we stand here at the Greenwood Culture Center and we walked past so many of the pictures of survivors who have died along the way uh, trying to get justice. I'm extremely excited that this morning we couldn't get this lawsuit filed before one of our survivors who's pictured on the screen here, Hal Singer passed away last weekend. I want to tell you that my team, who you will hear from, we have been in contact with Mr. Singer. We've talked to him and his beautiful family, and they were excited about the opportunity to continue to push for justice. And so with that, I, on one second, Jill. I just want to make sure that our screen here is it still showing on the Zoom. Obviously, I ask everyone to, to uh, bear, with, bear with us as we deal with the technology issues with COVID, making everything a lot more difficult. So I think our, our Zoom feed uh, ended. So as I was saying, uh, we, we had been in contact with Hal Singer, and he was excited about moving forward with this litigation. Um, but he passed away this past weekend. So we couldn't keep him in the litigation because he's deceased now, but I did want to acknowledge him and also read a letter that we have from him, uh, or a portion of the letter, and then we make the full letter available on our website or on the justiceforgreenwood.org website. And this letter was written by Mr. Singer. I'm just going to read an excerpt. He says, I would like to tell you that I've never had any faith in the justice system of the United States when it comes to black people. You just need to watch what is going on without letting fake news or wrong analysis twist your judgment. He said, I've been traveling the world, I've been traveling the state since 1938, and been traveling the world since 1964, and America is not fair towards its black citizens. However, I am at your disposal for any testimony or contribution because we can lose a battle, but we have to fight for our rights and our dignity. And that is what we're doing here today. We're fighting for the rights and dignity of those individuals, those families that were massacred, looted, destroyed, and for this community that has been dealing with the continual massacre, the continual harm since 1921. So with the passing of Mr. Singer, we know of only two known living survivors. One is a 106-year-old woman named Viola Fletcher who lives in Bartersville, and one is a 105-year-old woman who lives right here in Tulsa, Leslie Benefield Randall, who we so proudly represent. My team, who you hear from here shortly, includes lawyers from across the nation. Uh, we have Stephen uh, Terrell and Spencer Bryant from the Bryant Terrell Law Firm, which is, has an office here in Tulsa and one in Denver, Colorado. We have Professor Eric Miller, who you hear from, who's a professor at Loyola and Marymount University. We have uh, Attorney Maynard Henry Sr., who's a civil rights, human rights attorney out of Virginia. We have a couple of other local attorneys, Cordell Cephas and Lashandra Johnson, who are based here in Tulsa, and then our, our dean attorney, attorney Adra Ayatour, um, magnificent human rights attorney, Professor Emeritus from the University of Arkansas, Little Rock. Real quickly, our plaintiffs. This case is a public nuisance case. You'll hear more about that. We do have named plaintiffs but the case covers the entire community and it covers all those who were impacted by the massacre. We did have these named plaintiffs, which includes Vernon AME, which is the only known structure to still exist pre-1921. 
We have Laurel Stratford, who's representing the J.B. Stratford family. J.B. Stratford was the richest man in Greenwood at the time. He owned the largest hotel in Greenwood, in, in the nation, largest black-owned hotel in the nation. Eloise Price Cochran, who is a, a daughter of the, this, a, this, uh, a massacre survivor, Clarence Rowland, but she's also the cousin of Dick Rowland, who was falsely accused of assaulting or sexually assaulting a Caucasian female, which caused or jumped off the, the massacre. Tedra Williams, who's the granddaughter of one of our most passionate survivors fighting for justice until he passed away in 2014, which is Wes Young. Don M. Adams, who is the heir to Dr. A.C. Jackson. Dr. A.C. Jackson was murdered with his hands up. Well, he was shot with his hands up and then allowed to bleed out in the concentration camp for four or five hours. You have Don W. Adams, who's the great-grandson of attorney H.A. Guess. Attorney H.A. Guess was one of the attorneys you've seen the famous picture of attorneys having to fight lawsuits and try to fight for the people of Greenwood in a tent. Attorney H.A. Guess was one of those attorneys. Stephen Williams, who's the grandson of the great A.J. Smitherman, A.J. Smitherman was the publisher and editor of the Tulsa Star newspaper, which was the first African-American newspaper to have a, day, a, a national circulation. And then we have the Tulsa African Ancestral Society, which has been working on this issue and keeping alive the memory of the ancestors that lived here in Greenwood. So I just want to real quickly frame the lawsuit before you hear from my team. We know that in 1921, the city, this county, the, the defendants tried to run black people out of Tulsa, as this postcard says, running a Negro out of Tulsa. We know it was total and complete devastation of our community, 40, almost 40 blocks decimated. Complete, 40 square blocks decimated. Homes burnt. Homes burnt. Businesses burnt. Okay, that good? That works. Okay. So we said we know the devastation. We don't really know exactly how many people were killed. We have we don't know. All we know is from our survivors, who we spent so much time with, that they said people just disappeared. They didn't show up, and they, they didn't see him any longer. And this, this unfortunate brother, who has blood spatter on his on his on his chest, we know about the killings, but we also know that we were humiliated as they marched us down the street with our hands up in the air, taking us to what the Tulsa world called concentration camps. And we also know that people did this with impunity. No one to this day has been held accountable. Someone said recently that the folks who committed the massacre almost got away with it. Well, they did get away with it until today. So you're going to hear from my team, the lawyers, first starting with Eric Miller, as we talk about this case and really what it's about. And so you can have a clear understanding of why we're bringing this case now and why we believe this case will be successful. So Eric is going to discuss the immediate aftermath of the massacre. So the massacre created this nuisance. It created this problem. But let's talk about the immediate aftermath of the massacre. Thanks, Mario. I am Eric Miller, that's spelled E-R-I-C-M-I-L-L-E-R, -L -L -E and I'm here to tell you about the immediate aftermath of the massacre. Overwhelmingly, white businesses and political leaders have sought to appropriate the history of the massacre for their own interests. They've done this since the days following the massacre itself. In the immediate aftermath of the massacre, 
members of the State National Guard, the County Sheriff's Department, and the Tulsa Police Department herded the survivors of the massacre into internment camps where they were held for up to three days. In a scheme concocted along with the Chamber of Commerce, White Tulsans could sponsor an internee and farm them out for work under threat of violence and without pay in conditions that amounted to slave labor. Under this scheme, black residents of Tulsa were marked with a literal badge of inferiority, a green card that the survivors had to wear to avoid reprisals. The city and its white business class next saw an opportunity to grab the land they had burned from the survivors of the massacre. They ensured that the victims received no compensation from the city of Tulsa and enacted illegal fire regulations and zoning ordinances to prevent the survivors from rebuilding. For the rest of the summer and through the winter, thousands of massacre victims lived as refugees on their own land in Red Cross tents. The city and county had destroyed the leadership of the community by murdering local leaders, professionals, and business owners during the massacre. After the massacre, the county impaneled a grand jury to indict black community leaders such as J.B. Stratford, an hotelier and businessman, and A.J. Smitherman, a local attorney. These leaders fled the state, never to return. White Tulsans have sought to tell the history of the massacre in ways that most benefit themselves. When word of the massacre spread across the country, money started to flow in to help the survivors. The defendants, including the Chamber of Commerce, decided that they would be the ones to tell the story of the Tulsa massacre, and that they would determine what to do with the money. Immediately after the massacre, the City of Tulsa and the Chamber of Commerce colluded to minimize the impact of the massacre in the local and national press. Initially, they appropriated for themselves money sent from around the country to help the homeless, destitute victims. To minimize the financial harm to white businesses, the white community falsely labeled the massacre a riot and blamed the destruction on the black residents of Greenwood. When that was not enough to rehabilitate the reputation of white business leaders, the city, the county, and the Chamber of Commerce denied that the massacre had ever happened and affirmatively rejected aid from around the country intended to assist the massacre victims. For the next 75 years, white political and business leaders silenced black Tulsans and the Greenwood diaspora from recounting their experiences of the massacre and from demanding restitution. Now we're going to hear from attorney Lysandra Peoples Johnson, who's going to explain the continual harm during the 1920s. Thank you, Demario. My name is Lysandra Peoples Johnson. L-A-S-H-A-N-D-R-A P-E-O-P-L-E-S hyphen J-O-H-N-S-O-N Today, I'm going to speak with you about how the defendants prevented rebuilding and expansion. From the massacre until the present day, the defendants have imposed or supported policies that stifled the ability of Greenwood residents to rebuild and thrive, except to the extent that development and preservation would benefit the parts of Tulsa that are predominantly white. Defendants curtailed economic, social, and cultural opportunities in the Greenwood and North Tulsa community, redirecting those benefits to white businesses and institutions in other parts of Tulsa to the detriment of African Americans in Greenwood and North Tulsa. In the days and weeks following the massacre, city and county officials and local white businessmen, including members of the chamber, 
engaged in unlawful acts designed to prevent reconstruction of Greenwood. Specifically, the city and chamber unlawfully pushed for changes in fire regulations and zoning laws that illegally deprived Greenwood community members of their property without due process of law. These zoning changes, which were eventually declared unlawful by the Oklahoma Supreme Court, made reconstruction efforts prohibitively costly for Greenwood residents. The defendants' unlawful actions ultimately left survivors of the massacre to live in makeshift tents as their shelter into the winter, subjecting them to cold, filth, and disease for up to a year after the massacre. Further, the city and chamber affirmatively rejected monetary aid from around the country that was intended to assist those who had been displaced as a result of the massacre. Their material misrepresentations also prevented Greenwood residents, including business owners, from collecting on insurance policies, leaving them no choice but to use any savings and capital they had or undertake exorbitant debt just to rebuild. Lastly, in the years following the massacre, the defendants continued to support the Greenwood community, being terrorized by racist threats in the form of the Ku Klux Klan, or the KKK. In fact, all five of the men who incorporated the Tulsa KKK in January of 1922 were prominent leaders of the city, county, and chamber. Thank you, Lashandra. Next, you'll hear from attorney Maynard Henry as he just gives a brief summary of the continued massacre, the continued devastation and harm through the 30s to the 70s. Thank you, Demario. I am Maynard Martin Henry Sr. It is spelled M-A-Y-N-A-R-D, M-A-R-T-I-N, last name Henry, H-E-N-R-Y. I am going to talk about the continuing harm, the continuing nuisance that persisted between 1930 through the 70s due to the conduct of the defendants. Defendants' continuing unlawful action and missions violated Greenwood and subsequently North Tulsa residents' constitutional rights to equal protection under the Oklahoma law, rendering them insecure in their lives and property. The massacre and its ongoing marginalization of black Tulsans constitute racial terrorism and inflicts deep traumatic and psychological wounds on survivors, witnesses, family members, and the entire American, African American community. In the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, the defendant's city and county unlawfully neglected their duty to provide public services, utilities, and amenities to the Greenwood neighborhood, such as paved streets, running water, sewers, and regular trash pickup, and comparable number of parks and playgrounds. In 1958, Tulsa Urban League published a report entitled, quote, A Concise Review of Housing Problems Affecting Negroes in Tulsa, end quote, that documents these concerns. The defendants' unlawful acts and omissions in the years and decades following the massacre blighted the Greenwood neighborhood, endangering the health and safety of the Greenwood community. The city's unlawful acts and violation of duty led to lack of adequate code-compliant housing during the 1950s that continues to this day. The defendant's interference with investment in the Greenwood and North Tulsa community and neighborhood, which began after the massacre, continues to this day. There is still no viable public infrastructure in these communities. For example, the city has yet to replace structures and other institutions destroyed by the massacre. Since the massacre, the defendants have oppressed and undermined the predominantly black Tulsa, North Tulsa community that were diverting resources to other communities to the detriment of the health, safety, and security of the black community in Tulsa. During the 1930s, the city, with the support of the chamber, engaged in more extensive racial segregation and public employment than any other southern and southwestern city. Similarly, in the 1920s through the 60s, the city and the Chamber of Commerce unlawfully excluded the few African-American businesses run by members of the Greenwood and North Tulsa communities from participation in business opportunities. Chamber even excluded Greenwood and North Tulsa black-owned businesses in its publicity materials commemorating the Oklahoma's 50th anniversary. Throughout the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the defendant's city, county, and chamber, acting through the Tulsa Development Authority and the Tulsa Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, implemented or promoted policies of urban renewal 
and urban planning initiatives without regard for the health and safety needs of the Greenwood community and Black Tulsans. The, the defendants unlawful fair to include the Greenwood and North Tulsa communities in the decision-making process. In short, any urban renewal plan would not serve these communities, but would rather serve the interests of the predominantly white South Tulsa residents. This exacerbated the nuisance conditions in the Greenwood and North Tulsa neighborhoods. The initiatives adopted by the defendants led to further fragmentation of the Greenwood community and, and deepened the Tulsa's geographical, racial, and wealth divide that still exists today. Thanks, Maynard. Now we're going to talk about, I hear from attorney Cordell Cephas as he talks about this continual harm through the 80s to the 2000s. Thank you very much, Demario. Uh, my name is Cordell Cephas. That's C-O-R-D-A-L. Cephas, C-E-P-H-A-S. I want to take a few moments and speak with you about Greenwood and North Tulsa during the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. We're gonna fast forward some 60 years from the devastating and tragic and ultimately horrific events that took place during the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. And we find ourselves in 1980s Tulsa. Unfortunately, we don't find what we would expect to find and we don't see what we hope to see. No, there is no longer a shining city on a hill. Instead, Greenwood has become a mere shell of its former self. This once vibrant economic and cultural center for black Tulsans has all but been eradicated. Tulsa instead shows house upon house, street upon street, and block upon block, infected with the plague of housing blight and is spreading from North Tulsa neighborhood to North Tulsa neighborhood. There's no longer any viable economic activity taking place in North Tulsa. Entrepreneurs are no longer pressing their way to set up their shop in the center of the community. Major manufacturers, major retailers are no longer vying for the opportunity to set up their shops in North Tulsa. No, that time is long gone. No, this doesn't happen under the cover of dark. It doesn't happen in the middle of the night. It happens within full view of the defendants. These same defendants who attacked North Tulsa and destroyed the economic viability of the community subsequently refused to allow the survivors to go back and rebuild their homes and businesses. These same defendants have had access in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s to federal dollars with which they could have applied and rebuilt North Tulsa. These same defendants, when they've had federal dollars earmarked for rebuilding North Tulsa, have instead diverted those funds to other areas of the city. Ultimately, these defendants have left the plaintiffs to bear the burden of the defendant's actions. It is time that that nuisance be abated and that these plaintiffs have their day. Thank you. Thank you, Cordell. The next speaker you will hear from is Stephen Terrell. He's talking about what is the impact of everything you've heard about this nuisance. Before Stephen talks, I want to make it clear that we're talking about the destruction of Greenwood or Black Wall Street. Now, Greenwood is limited to a half a block. But Greenwood was 40 blocks. Greenwood was four square miles. They've limited Greenwood to half a block and want to call that Greenwood and the Black Wall Street. That's part of the legacy of the continual impact and harm. And as Stephen Terrell is going to talk about, what does that look like with numbers? Thank you, Demario. My name is Stephen Terrell. S-T-E-V-E-N-T-E-R-R-I-L-L. -E -E -L -L. I'm an attorney and partner with the Bryan and Terrell Law Firm located in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm a native Tulsan, and I was raised on the south side of Tulsa, but was fortunate enough to go to public school on the north side. As a young kid and uh, emerging adult, I was able to see the um, disparity and the differences between community that I lived in and the community that I went to school in. And even today, it's not difficult to drive through the various communities in Tulsa and see that North Tulsa is very different. The opportunities or lack thereof are readily apparent to anyone. The racial divide that has taken hold of this city is also very apparent. 
the opportunities that we see uh, for white Tulsans is very different than those of what opportunities are provided or available to Black Tulsa or the North Tulsa community. And these different opportunities, they take form in jobs and financial security, education and housing, and even health. Unemployment with the Tulsa Black community is more than twice that of unemployment for white Tulsans. The median household income for white Tulsa is almost twice that of black Tulsans. White Tulsans enjoy approximately $20,000 more in median income than black Tulsans do. Black students are nine times more likely than white students to be suspended at school. Black youths are arrested nearly three and a half times that of white youth. The infant mortality of black Tulsans is over four times that of white Tulsans. And studies indicate that North Tulsa residents are twice as likely to use emergency room visits than white Tulsans. So what does that mean at the end of the day? It means that there is a huge divide between what is provided and available to white Tulsans and the South Tulsa community or other communities when we compare it to the North Tulsa community. Thank you, Steve. And to further illustrate the point Steve was making, I think this slight story by NBC done in June further shows what we know here in Tulsa, that there is a complete difference between black Tulsa and white Tulsa. Here in Tulsa. Here from attorney Adra Atour, she's gonna talk about how the same defendants who created the massacre, who prolonged the massacre, are now using the massacre's history to their benefit and not the benefit of the actual victims. Good morning. My name is Adjua Artisayapur, and I am committed to seeking justice for Greenwood as a member of Justice for Greenwood Advocate. Justice means full acknowledgement of how the city of Tulsa and others caused the destruction of the Greenwood District in North Tulsa in 1921 and continued destructive practices and policies that led to the nuisance my colleagues discussed today. Justice for Greenwood means that the city, other defendants, business people, and entrepreneurs stop appropriating the story of Greenwood to advance the interests of predominantly white and privileged Tulsa. This appropriation of the story of the criminal and heinous acts of racial terrorism committed by white Tulsa governmental and non-governmental institutions, leaders, and residents is yet another injury to survivors, descendants of those murdered, injured, and whose personal and real property was taken or destroyed, and to black Tulsans in the Greenwood and North Tulsa community and neighborhood. It is another version of the conspiracy of silence about the massacre that the, that the defendants instituted in 1921 and that lasted for 75 years. This conspiracy of silence is shrouded in memorials, tourist attractions that include the appropriation of the stories of those who were murdered, injured, and lost personal and real property without formal apology and any concrete program to make direct material reparations to the descendants of those whose lives and property they destroyed in the community that continues to bear the brunt of a harm, the nuisance. Rather than investing in a concrete reparative plan for the devastation for which they are responsible, the city, chamber, and others did nothing until they realized the benefit to them of marketing the history of the massacre, bringing money to them with none designated for those who continue to live and relive their devastating acts. After years of inhumane disregard and failure to act to rebuild the viable, thriving community they willfully destroyed, they saw the benefits their own violent and brutal destruction of lives, property, and hope would bring to the city. They did not hesitate to use their crimes against those Greenwood and North Tulsa residents to develop strategies to bring money, tourism, and recognition to Tulsa. 
Salsa obtained a $1 million grant from the Bloomberg Foundation. It has raised money in its profile by highlighting the race massacre it caused and destruction for which it was and is responsible. The city, Chamber of Commerce, and the county joined with others to develop Greenwood Rising History Center and appropriate the names Greenwood District and Black Wall Street using images and the stories of those they killed, injured, and whose property they destroyed. The city built sprawling University Center at Tulsa, now Oklahoma State University, Tulsa, on the land that once was owned by black people in a thriving community they destroyed. And all this take. Good morning. Keep moving along. <clears throat> One thing that Audra mentioned before we get to our legal claim, and Spencer will explain, we have two claims, two specific claims. Spencer's going to, he is going to explain the first, the public nuisance claim. But Audra mentioned land ownership, and she said that several times. And that was the backbone of Greenwood. It was land that was owned by the black residents. Many of those black residents were actually here before statehood. Some had been here since the 1830s, like my family, with the Creek Nation and also Black Cherokee. So it was about land ownership. And anything we're talking about repairing, restoring, and respecting with the massacre has to have a conversation about land ownership in that conversation. But as we move forward in this presentation and talk about our legal claims, you'll hear from my classmate, uh, Spencer Bryant, who went to Carver and Booker T. Washington High School with me. My name is Spencer Bryan. I am part of the Greenwood litigation team, and I am here to discuss the claim for a public nuisance. A public nuisance under Oklahoma law is generally defined as the performance of an unlawful act or the failure to perform a duty that renders an individual insecure in their life or ability to use property or causes annoyance or endangers their comfort, safety, and repose. The 1921 race massacre unquestionably satisfies the definition of a public nuisance. The city of Tulsa destroyed an entire community and displaced its citizens. The question that most will have is, does the 1921 race massacre and its effects continue today? And on that point, the answer is an unequivocal yes. The statistics bear out that an individual who resides in North Tulsa today has a life expectancy that is 11 years shorter than their counterparts throughout the city. This is an effect of the 1921 race massacre, the displacement of the community, and the consequences of those actions and the manner in which the city has treated that community for the last 100 years. Additionally, the ongoing effects of the race massacre are essentially without dispute. The elected officials for the city of Tulsa and Tulsa business leaders have both explicitly admitted that the effects of the 1921 race massacre still exist today, 100 years later. Having established that the 1921 race massacre is a public nuisance, and having established that the effects of that race massacre still exist today, the question remains, what can be done? The answer is in the statute, and it comes in the form of what we know as abatement. Abatement is essentially a vehicle that provides for labor or money to return the community subjected to the nuisance back to the place that it would have been in 
but for the unlawful act. Essentially, this is a mechanism to restore Greenwood and the surrounding community and the people that reside there to the position that they would have been in, but for the unlawful actions taken by the city of Tulsa and the defendants. We believe that this case is a righteous case and it is substantially supported by the evidence and we certainly look forward to litigating this matter and bringing justice to the individuals in uh, Greenwood and the greater Tulsa area. Thank you. Thank you, Spencer. We have an Audra tour. She's going to talk about our second claim, which is unjust enrichment. But I want to make sure everyone is clear when we say the public nuisance. The specific statute is 51 OS 1. That's 51 OS 1. And some of you may remember that just last year, the state of Oklahoma won a $550 million landmark verdict against the opioid company utilizing this same um, statute the public nuisance statute and in that case they went back 35 40 years talking about how the nuisance was created and continued and this is the same theory that we have and as spencer stated it is no question that the nuisance was created and as mayor bynum said recently and mike neal said recently there's no question that the impacts of the 1921 massacre is still in a impacting us today and that is the key root of the disparities that you've heard about in Tulsa. And so we say, as we go into the 100 year commemoration, that if we're going to change the, attitude, the, the, the trajectory of those descendants and those survivors and the black community in Tulsa, we must have repair, we must have restoration, and we must have respect, as how Singer told us, we must fight for our dignity, no matter what. So now we're going to hear again from attorney Audra Artur, she talks about the unjust enrichment claim. I have been asked to explain the claim we are making for unjust enrichment. The lawsuit asked the court to find that the defendants have been unjustly enriched by their actions of appropriating the story of the massacre, including the black lives that were lost or devastated to raise money to attract tourism and raise the profile of Tulsa. Yet, they have not reached out to and included survivors and descendants of those whose lives they took and property they destroyed in their plans as, and as direct beneficiaries of their appropriations. Proof of unjust enrichment requires the proof of three elements. One, the defendants receive a benefit. Two, at the plaintiff's expense, and three, under circumstances that make it unjust for the defendants to retain the benefit without commensurate, that means appropriate, compensation. I described the benefits earlier that the defendants are receiving. Money, construction of tourist attractions that will bring more money, and erasing their negative image and profile. It is unjust for the defendants to retain benefits from a destruction and devastation they caused and that continue to reverberate today in the lives of the plaintiffs who are descendants of those who, whose lives were lost and property destroyed, as well as in the lives of residents of the North Tulsa community and neighborhood. Justice requires that they utilize the benefits they are and will receive by marketing the race massacre of 1921 to make reparations to the plaintiffs and abate the nuisance they created in North Tulsa. Thank you, Audra. Next, we're going to talk about our specific remedies that we're asking the court to order to give us this respect, restoration, and repair. Uh, before I do that, though, anyone that's listening now online, particularly, that you want to help us in this fight, this historic lawsuit, you can go to www.justiceforgreenwood.org. That's justiceforgreenwood.org. It's an organization that is helping this fight. It's a 501c3 foundation that is committed to justice for those impacted. And we have someone here, Dr. Crutcher, will talk about that a little bit further later on. But let's talk about the specific legal remedy that we're asking the court to order as an abatement to restore Greenwood to where, they, where Greenwood should have been and would have been if not for the actions of the defendants. First, you're gonna hear again from Eric Miller. 
Thank you, Demario. I'm going to explain why the remedy for a public nuisance provides restoration and repair for the survivors of the massacre, the descendants of the victims, and the current residents of Greenwood and North Tulsa. The remedy for a public nuisance is for the folks who caused the problem to fix it. Lawyers call this remedy abatement. We will ensure that the remaining survivors, the descendants of the victims, and the members of the Greenwood and North Tulsa community are the people who get to tell the history of the massacre for themselves and who direct the financial, social, cultural, and political well-being of their community. Justice for Greenwood is for the survivors, victims, descendants, and black residents of Greenwood and North Tulsa to determine for themselves. The City of Tulsa, the Chamber of Commerce, and the other defendants created a public nuisance grounded in racism and which is an ongoing public health crisis. Black Tulsans deserve to direct the rebuilding of a safe and secure community for themselves. Justice for Greenwood is not the property of the city of Tulsa and the other defendants to give away as they choose. Since 2001, when the history of Black Wall Street was recovered and celebrated by African Americans, the city government and the Chamber of Commerce sought to appropriate the history of the massacre for itself. For them, the Greenwood District is nothing more than a tourist attraction. Rather than include the African American survivors and descendants or other black Tulsans in telling the history of the massacre, the city and chamber of commerce have turned Black Wall Street into a brand for white Tulsans to sell. The city and chamber have declined to address the continuing impacts of Tulsa's policies in producing a geographically and socially isolated black community marked by economic, health, educational, and safety deficits. Marginalizing the black survivors, diaspora, and Tulsa community minimizes the continuing impact of the massacre on these people today. None of them have received compensation for their losses. Their voices are missing from the histories of the massacre. For example, Leslie Randall, our plaintiff, who is 105 years old and one of the last three still living survivors of the massacre, continues to see the images of the black bodies that were stacked up on the street as her neighborhood was burning. She constantly relives the terror of May 31st and June 1st, 1921. And yet the city of Tulsa has done nothing to compensate her for the damage that it has inflicted upon her life. The defendants are to foot the costs necessary to compensate the massacre survivors and descendants of the victims, as well as the residents of Greenwood and North Tulsa by promoting political, education, and business institutions run by the Greenwood diaspora and the black citizens of North, North Tulsa, as well as providing the people still affected by the massacre and the continuing public nuisance with the ability to determine how best to memorialize the massacre. We seek an injunction requiring the defendants who use the likenesses of the victims of the massacre to provide fair and equitable compensation to the descendants. Because justice for Greenwood is for black residents of Greenwood and North Tulsa to determine for themselves, we will obtain an injunction prohibiting defendants from receiving any money or other material benefits from their appropriation of the massacre and the legacy and reputation of the Greenwood district and neighborhood. Any fees due to defendants associated with providing licensing and other services to private or public groups to implement this appropriation, including the Greenwood Rising History Center, shall be placed in a Victims' Compensation Fund. That fund shall be available to individual members of the Greenwood and North Tulsa communities, as well as local grassroots black-owned and black-led organizations and businesses to rebuild the social, economic, cultural, 
and political infrastructure and integrity of their communities. As Eric talked about the early 2000s when activities started again with Greenwood, I must just want to recognize and thank the hard work of Representative Don Ross and Senator Maxine Horner, who worked diligently in the House and the Senate, Oklahoma State House and Senate, during that time period to really push the Tulsa Race Riot Commission report and get us moving down this road where we are today. Now, Audra is going to talk about a few more of the legal remedies that we will be seeking and will be obtaining from the court. We are requesting as a part of the remedy that the court require the defendants to provide a record of all the benefits they received by appropriating the massacre and the nuisance it created. And accounting is a legal term for this request. In a case such as this, where the defendant has benefited from an injury it caused the plaintiffs, and the plaintiffs do not know all the benefits the defendants have received, the court can order defendants to provide that information. This allows the plaintiffs and the court to determine the amount of the unjust enrichment and the amount that should go to the plaintiffs. For example, in our request for an accounting, we are asking for all money raised by the defendants through private and public sources since 2010 from marketing of the Greenwood District and Neighborhood or North Tulsa as the site of the massacre. All money received by the defendants from public and private sources for use in Greenwood neighborhood and community from June 1, 1921 to 1960. All money rate received by the defendants from public and private sources for use in North Tulsa from 1960 to the present. All benefits, including money, defendants receive from licensing private groups to engage in the appropriation of Black Wall Street and the massacre. Finally, we are asking that any money the court orders be given as a result of this accounting be placed in a victim's compensation fund that will be used to the benefit of plaintiffs and North Tulsa. Thank you, Audra. Uh, now we're going to turn to our portion of the presentation where we hear from some of our plaintiffs that are here. But before we go, there are a few other things that we're going to be seeking from the court is we want to audit of all the land in the, in the historical Greenwood District. We do not believe that the land is actually, all the land is actually have good title. We know that land was stolen after people were killed. For instance, Dr. A.C. Jackson, who was killed, he had no children. What happened to his land? We don't know, but we want to know. We also want to know how many people were actually killed and the value that, that, that they left from their families. We want to know that. We also call in for a scholarship program that benefits the actual survivors and the descendants. Not some citywide, statewide scholarship program, but a program that benefits those who suffered so they can go to school and bring back into the community their skills and talents to help build this community up. We also are calling for an abatement an abatement of all policies and laws in this city that continue to degrade black life. That's policing laws, that's housing laws, et cetera. So this is all detailed in our, our, our petition that we filed this morning, more succinctly, more specifically. And there may be other things as we work with the community. This is a grassroots, organ, uh, up, grassroots project. We're working with the community. We're speaking for the community what the community wants us to say. We're not trying to tell the community what they need. We're working with the community. And with that, I want to bring up our first plaintiff. I'm going to say all of our plaintiffs couldn't be here for various reasons, COVID, the weather, et cetera. But we do have one brother here, and I'm really excited to bring and introduce him, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Robert Turner, uh, the historic Vernon AME Church. And I'm sure he'll tell you uh, the story when we first talked about this. But just real quickly, I know he has explained it. Vernon AME is the only structure that we know of, the only one that is still around after the massacre. All right? So that's the only thing that still stands that was built by the black people of Greenwood that are still here today. 
And that's why we are so proud to represent Historic Vernon and we appreciate all the work of Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner. Good, good afternoon. <clears throat> I would like to <clears throat> stand and <coughs> and I got some water or something. But I would like to just stand and before I even start, I'd like to acknowledge the bravery of attorney DeMario Solomon Simmons, who shortly after I first arrived here in Tulsa, and I found the story and researched the history of the church and saw how there was an effort back in the early 2000s to get repair and how Vernon was not a part of that original lawsuit and so that we may have some standing legally. And of all the people that I spoke to, the only one that was brave enough to take on this case and to look into it legally was that of attorney DeMario Solomon Simmons. So I think if we all can give him a round of applause for his leadership. I stand here on behalf of, my voice is coming back, thank you, Lord, those members of our church who saw the worst race massacre in American history. I stand here on behalf of first black doctor in the city, R.T. Bridgewater. I stand here on behalf of H.A. Guest, first black attorney in this city. I stand here on behalf of Ellis Walker Woods, the first black principal in this city. I stand here remembering trailblazers that have gone on before who fought for reparations such as Attorney Spears, Chappelle, and Franklin, and guests, and those such as Eddie Faye Gates. And I'm honored today to be a part and plaintiff in this lawsuit to the city of Tulsa and to those entities that were mentioned that have profited off human suffering. First of all, they caused, thank you, the suffering, killing and burning down churches. And as a pastor, as a faith leader, it is appalling the lack of support from the faith community in regard to us seeking justice. I was a missionary. I went to Kenya, Egypt, and even New Orleans after, after Hurricane Katrina. And I can tell you the number of Christians all over the world that are pouring money into various countries for where churches have been persecuted and destroyed. But not one of those churches, not one of those white churches in Tulsa, after the race mask of 1921, helped us at all. But they would send their money overseas to build up churches, to help out those who are being persecuted. But when the church was persecuted right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, not one of those churches lifted a finger. And now the city is talking about how terrible the massacre is, was, and raising money off the massacre and building buildings off the massacre but yet is not willing to do justice to the victims who were killed in the mask. It's almost like, it's not almost, it is. You raping a woman and you making money off talking about the rape. How would you feel if that was your daughter? The person that raped your daughter is now going around the world 
talking about the rape and making money off the rape. That is what Tulsa does to this community. That is so much more than a tourist site. It's a crime scene. And until Tulsa does right by Greenwood, this district will forever be a crime scene. So I thank God for those of you who are here and let us continue to fight for justice. Thank you, Dr. Turner. One of, uh, another one of our named plaintiffs is actually here today. I just call him Chief, and a good friend, a family member of mine, actually, that I've been working with uh, over the last 20 plus years on this issue, and I'm so excited uh, that we are once again standing shoulder to shoulder in this, in this uh, path to justice, as you said, Dr. Turner. Chief representing the Tulsa African Ancestral Society, and he also tell you he's a, a direct descendant of those who suffered in the massacre. Before I start, I'd like to read a statement on behalf of um, my godfather, Wes Young, and on behalf of the Young family. We are affirmed by the representation of this esteemed firm for the justice we seek. If they cannot hear us, it is because they chose not to listen. They chose to close their ears. For they know the truth of what they did then and do now. Descendants of West Young Sr. Each day, warrior scholars need words that give them cause to consider the significance of what they must do. Each day, dedicated revolutionaries must articulate and refine the nature of their service to African people. Each day, conscious workers deserve to have their thoughts recognized and their intent validated by minds of equal spirit. Each day, those who would die for us should be reminded that they will never be alone and their thoughts are those of every member of the warrior class, seasoned elder warriors, and must be the most deserving and honored ancestors. Ashe. As um, Attorney DeMario Solomon said, and I, I really want to thank him for his work. We've been doing this since we were children. We've been in this fight for a very long time. And I want to thank his wife for enduring with him. This has been a really remarkable movement, um, a remarkable journey. We've been in this room, in this building many times. I'm the president of the African Ancestral Society, descendant of Raymond Beard Sr., who lived at 524 North Greenwood. That's at the far end of the pond behind this building. Imagine this room filled with over 200 traumatized children, all telling a horrific story about what happened the summer of 1921. Over 15 years ago, in this very room, those same children once again told their story, opened their hearts, and let the world know what had happened to them. And they were denied justice the charred baton has been passed on to their descendants. 15 days after the massacre, former mayor, Judge Lowell J. Hart, uh, Martin, chair of the emergency committee appointed to restore af order after the riot, acknowledged that Tulsa can only redeem herself from the countrywide shame and humiliation into which she is, a she is today plunged by complete restitution and rehabilitation of the black belt. The rest of the United States must know that the real citizenship of Tulsa will make good the damage, so far as it can be done to the last penny. 
We have neglected our duties and our city government has fallen down. We have had failing police protection here and now we have to pay the cost of it. The city and county are legally liable for every dollar of damage which has been done. Other cities have had to pay the bill of race riots and we shall have to do so probably because we have neglected our duty as citizens. The statement reveals a stark contrast between past and current leadership. The outcome of this lawsuit will, de deter will determine whether or not this city has changed at all. Almost a hundred years later, the only conciliation has come in the form of a medallion and an apology absent of remedy from both the city and state. Imagine if the victims of the Twin Towers or the Oklahoma City Murrow Building bombing were offered a survivor's medallion and an apology as a form of remedy. It is an unimaginable thought. What's more unimaginable and distasteful is to imagine waiting almost 80 years just for a medallion. We have carried Tulsa's secret and worn the collective trauma for too long without remedy. It would truly be a shame for the same entities to pretend to commemorate 100 years of injustice without providing measures, just measures, to right a century-old wrong? Or will this 100-year commemoration be clothed in shame and decorated with the chains of the enslaved who came to Oklahoma seeking freedom? Thank you. Thank you, Chief, and thank you for invoking that meeting we had so many of the survivors. And I, I think about the survivors. I think about all the time that I got to travel back and forth to D.C. with Otis Clark, Olivia Hooker, Wes Young. I think about Otis Clark having that medallion on and saying, this is it. This is it. I think about Otis Clark at 99 years old telling the story of having to flee to no water and hide. And when he came back, he never saw his stepfather again. He don't know what happened to him. He never saw his neighbors, the Talbots, again. He don't know what happened to him. He just never saw him again. He went to his house, nothing but ashes, he said. And then he talks about his bulldog named Bob. Now, this man was 99 years old at the time talking about missing his bulldog named Bob, who he said, I know he fought to protect our house and our community. We stand for those men and women, those children who built the American dream with their own hard earth work and sweat and know-how, one generation out of enslavement, to have it burnt down. You talked about the Public Welfare Committee. What they do with the money that they got from around the country that came in for the black folks? What they do with that money? I remember Wes Young. You mentioned Wes. And he said, after we had lost at the Supreme Court, they refused to hear the case. After the, the legislation didn't go anywhere at the U.S. Congress, I remember the video and he says, I guess this is just something I'm gonna have to bear. There's no need to go looking for victims in the ground when Mother Randall's still alive. 
There's no need to go looking in the ground when Viola Fletcher is still alive. We have two left. Next, we want to hear from my good friend, my my partner in the fight for truth, justice, and equality, who was thrust into a leadership position here in Tulsa because of the continuation of the massacre impacted her family in the shooting of Terrence Crutcher. And the cover up, just like they covered up the massacre, they covered up the shooting of Terrence Crutcher. And just how they said, we're not responsible for what happened to Terrence Crutcher. He killed himself. And they said the massacre was the responsibility of the black folks. They burnt themselves. It's the same spirit. It's the same nuisance. So Dr. Tiffany Crutcher is going to talk to you representing the Justice for Greenwood Foundation. Thank you so much, Attorney Solomon Simmons. Um, I don't even have words to express the admiration and the respect that I have for you, but thank you for taking on uh, this fight yet again. I stand here on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Justice for Greenwood Foundation. Justice for Greenwood Foundation is a 501c3 organization dedicated to reparations to the victims of the 1921 massacre and their descendants, accountability for the perpetrators of the 1921 massacre. We're dedicated to documenting and publicizing the stories of the 1921 massacres, massacre victims and their descendants. And last, we're dedicated to telling the truth about what happened during and after the 1921 massacre and its continued effect on the victims and their descendants. The Justice for Greenwood Foundation is excited to financially support this lawsuit. And we ask that you do the same thing. We have so many supporters signing on. You can sign on. You can support financially by going to Justice for greenwood.org and making a tax deductible donation. The community of Greenwood can never be the same until we are compensated. Museums, history centers, memorials, erections of historical markers are not reparations. I repeat, they are not reparations or compensation for the atrocity that took place right here on this sacred ground. As we prepare to commemorate the centennial of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, if steps aren't taken to lessen the wealth gap for blacks in this city or ensure that the descendants and the survivors are front and center, then it will simply be a farce. As I close, I stand here today along with other fierce, fierce advocates of Greenwood. My colleague and comrade, Mr. Greg Robinson II, Mrs. Christy Williams, who's been on the front line. Yes, you can give them a round of applause. And to all of the plaintiffs, we honor you. But we stand here obligated to carry on the mantle of the late Otis T. Clark, who challenged us in his last days, who challenged us after he was denied justice at the US Supreme Court, he challenged us to never, ever give up and never stop fighting for Greenwood. So Mr. Clark, if you're listening, to Olivia Hooker, if you're listening, to Wes Young, if you're listening, to Rebecca Brown Crutcher, if you're listening, we boldly accept your challenge to never stop advocating
for justice for Greenwood. It is now our burden to carry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. As we try to get wrapped up here, I won't read all the names, but I do want to recognize some of our national partners who are partnering with us in this, this historic lawsuit and project and campaign for justice for Greenwood. I would be remiss if I didn't say um, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative, also uh, the Human Rights Watch, Nicole Austin English. Uh, they've been tr tremendous uh, helping us along this way. They're with us every step of the way. There are many other national uh, civil rights organizations that are there. Uh, Karen Hunter Show. I don't want to read everyone's name because I'm trying to get to a point so we can get to a, a close here. But I do want to recognize that Professor Charles Ogletree is supporting this effort. He's not able to participate for medical reasons, but he's with us on this effort 100% of the way. And so we're excited and thankful for everyone that's on this list. Also for our national, I mean our local individuals, some that Dr. Crutcher has already recognized. Uh, we also have Representative Regina Goodwin in the audience who's always a fierce advocate for North Tulsa. Representative, would you like to say anything? Okay, I right. thank you for, for your leadership and always stand on the front lines for this community and your family, we appreciate you. And so this listing will be on our website. We have many more, but we wanted to just try to show you a sample that this is a grassroots project that involves this community. We started working on this project a year ago, talking with our community about what they wanna see, not going to them and telling them this is what it's gonna be, and this is how we're gonna let you participate, and these are the things that you can do for us. No, we said, what can we do for you? community. So with that being said, I have a few moments to take any uh, questions uh, that may uh, that you may have. Absolutely. Excellent question. The question is, why is this lawsuit different than a lawsuit from the uh, early 2000s? Number one, this is a state case. That was a federal case. That was a federal case for uh, Section 1983. As you know, I do a lot of federal law with 1983. This is a state case. And the, def and the state case is based on Oklahoma state law for a public nuisance. There is, if you look at, I think it's 50 OS... Uh, seven, I believe, there is no statute of limitation on a nuisance. So you ha the nuisance is there until it's abated. We believe this lawsuit will be successful because there is no question that there is a nuisance that was created by the defendants. And there is no question that the nuisance has never been abated. The defendants' own representatives have admitted that several times over the last year publicly. And you'll see those quotes in our petition. So we think it's an entirely different lawsuit. It's an entirely different uh, class, uh, court, and we do believe this is going to be successful. No, it, it doesn't have anything to do with the attention. It is about the victims. You know, when you say why now, and that's a fair question, the question was, you know, why now? We have not stopped trying to get justice. We have not stopped. Since I was at OU in 1997 and first learned about Greenwood and couldn't believe it, since that time has been a passion project. And it's unfortunate that so many people that I started with are, are now deceased. Literally everybody from that first case you talk about, they're all dead, all of them. Think about that. They all died knowing they couldn't get justice. We believe that this lawsuit is righteous at this time because there is a viable legal remedy. This is not a publicity stunt. This is not to bring awareness. There's enough awareness on Tulsa. This is a claim for public nuisance. This is a claim for unjust enrichment. You stole things, you took things, you had things that does not belong to you to this day, and the people should get it back. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Mario, I noticed uh, defendant number six is the current sheriff. Uh, why is he the 
Where well, is his official capacity? The sheriff's office. It's not the specific sheriff. It's the sheriff's office is a is a defendant. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. I have not reached out to them personally, um, but we will be reaching out to them very soon. We have some other announcements that we will have in the next couple of days um, that we will be able to share with you at that time. Now, I know that Bynum, Mayor Bynum's not facing this personally, but the city of Tulsa is. How come he wasn't named specifically in this suit versus just the overall city? Because it was the city that destroyed, that created the massacre, not Mayor Bynum. This is not about individuals in this lawsuit. This is about the entities that are still around that created the massacre, created the nuisance, and now are benefiting from the nuisance and or have not abated the nuisance. See, this is why people always try to make this such a difficult concept. It's just like blue car hits red car in the back. Red car is damaged. Blue car owes it. That's, that's all it is. And the blue car is the city of Tulsa. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. I can't hear you. Can you speak up? I know it's tough. No, don't don't spray Kim with your. You just speak up. <laughs> well, we believe the. The current precedent is the historic, wonderful case that the state of Oklahoma won last year. I mean, we say if the state of Oklahoma can use the public nuisance law to get a $500 million verdict against opioid companies for stuff that they did back in the 80s, we can use the public nuisance law for what happened and what is happening currently. That's the thing. We're not just talking about what happened in 1921. We're talking about what's happening right now as we stand here. It's a continual massacre. That highway is right there cutting through Greenwood. That's a continual massacre. That's a continual nuisance, period. Does that answer your question? We, are, we have no idea, but what I always tell any plaintiff, any litigation, three to five years, and you'll be, that'll be pretty good. We know this is gonna be a long fight this is going to be a difficult fight. We know the defendants are going to throw everything at us. And this is why we have prepared ourselves over this time period to get our team together. I'm very proud of my team. My team has worked so hard on this litigation. And I'm very proud of them, both lawyers and non-lawyers. And so we're here for the long haul. It's been 99 years. We hope it don't take that long. But as Hal Singer said, we, no matter what battles we lose, we must fight for our rights and our dignity, and that's what we plan to do. Yes, ma'am, Kim, and I see. Uh, someone asked earlier, they said, well, you know, this happened 100 years ago. Uh, a lot of the victims are no longer here. Uh, you know, the city is saying, but who are they going to sue? And my question is, can you just kind of simplify where you expect the funds to come from for the abatement compensation? Sure. First of all, we are suing the same entities that were around at that time, right? So that's, that's the answer to your first question. As far as where the funds are going to come from, I'm a lawyer. I'm not an accountant or an economist. That's not my job to decide where the defendant decides to pay the verdict or the settlement. That's their issue. My issue is to prove that a public nuisance occurred and that it needs to be abated. And I feel very strong that my team can prove that. And then they can talk about where they need to get the money. At this time, we don't even know how much we're talking about for a complete abatement. Right? You know, the state of Oklahoma asked for $17.2 billion against opioid companies, and they received 550 right? But it, they didn't ask for that right in the beginning. They had to get to that point and do an abatement plan. That's what we plan to do. So the things that we lay out in our petition are just the initial things that we laid out based upon our discussions with our community uh, supporters as community members. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, ma'am.
That's an excellent question. The question is, why are we calling for an actual hospital in North Tulsa? Because this was something that our community has been saying they needed for my whole life. There isn't a hospital. There's never been a hospital in North Tulsa in, in my lifetime. And it's a shame that we had the most renowned, competent surgeon in the world, black surgeon in the world, Dr. A.C. Jackson, here in Tulsa, who was murdered like a thug, a common criminal, shot in the stomach, and allowed to bleed out for five hours. We lost that. We believe if he would have lived, we would have a hospital in North Tulsa. And that's why we're calling for the Dr. A.C. Jackson Level 1 Trauma Hospital to be built in North Tulsa. Yeah, absolutely. I think all those aspects are appropriate. He asked the question, uh, is this a legislative fix or why the courts? I invite the Oklahoma State Legislature to do the right thing and pay for the damages they created. I invite the city council and the mayor Bynum to do the right thing and to pay the damage that was done. But as a lawyer, I can only work in the, in the areas where I can control. I work within the courts. We see a viable legal claim. We're going to pursue that. And we believe that if we get a fair shake from the judge, which I'm not exactly sure, um, and I do believe we will get a fair shake from the judge, based on my experience, that we have a, a really good shot of taking this case to trial. Now, what happens at trial, you never know. I always tell plaintiffs, you never know, because then it's out of our hands. It's in the hands of a third party. But do I believe that the court is the right place for this to be litigated? Yes, I do. And do I believe we have a judge that will be fair? I do. Any questions online, Jill? OK. OK. Hey, well, thank you so much. Please go to justiceforgreenwood.org and support this historic litigation. We thank you so much. And stay tuned for some uh, additional announcements in the next couple of days. Thank you.